Jennifer Morrison is the lead safety advocate at Mazda. And Jennifer, it's a pleasure to talk with you today. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm excited to talk safety. Let's talk safety because one of the things that you're talking about at Mazda is eliminating all fatalities in any kind of Mazda by 2040. And uh, that's a bold statement. And, and the reason I say that is, I'm sure you're aware, a decade ago, Volvo said that by 2020, there were not going to be any fatalities in any Volvo. And uh, here we are in 2024, and that came and went. And they're still talking safety, but they're no longer talking about eliminating fatalities. So what gives you the confidence to say that Mazda can achieve this by 2040? Yeah, it, it is a big goal, John, no doubt about that. Uh, there is really a, a, our approach to the safety philosophy has to come from our core safety philosophy. That is our goal, to eliminate fatalities. And these numbers are huge. The numbers of fatalities out there on the roadways, people sometimes disassociate from the fact that we lose over 40,000 people a year on our nation's highways. It's a huge number. And to me, it is way more than just a number. Um, I, in my previous role for the government, would do crash investigation and go out and actually stand on the pavement out there as a responder to these massive crashes involving heavy trucks, buses, passenger cars. And I know that we need to do something, um, even if that something is creating an impactful goal of setting zero fatalities, because that is what we're up against. We have some huge issues out there that are that are, we're going to have to crawl uphill against impairment, distraction, um, even belt use. Some of these topics where we need to make huge improvements. Um, so yeah, our goal is zero fatalities by by 2040. Um, there's there's going to be a multi phase approach to get there, but that's our goal. So let's talk about some of the technologies that are going to enable that. What are you thinking about at Mazda? It's a combination of the crash avoidance and the crash worthiness. So we can kind of separate those two sides. Um, let's talk first about the crash avoidance because that's the first thing. You want to just avoid getting involved in a crash at all, right? That's really where we want to focus. Of course, we have um, automatic emergency braking, AEB, and pedestrian automatic emergency braking, PAEB, deployed as standard equipment on all of our vehicles. That was actually part of the industry agreement several years ago. The most like 95% of all vehicles on the road today have those technologies, but being deploying them is just phase one, right? That's just part one. We've got to improve them. A lot of those technologies that were initially rolled out were really set for lower speeds, you know, 12 to 20 miles per hour. That has to get better. Um, there's efforts on the, in the federal side with NHTSA uh, posting an NPRM and eventually a final rule we hear on that. And also we have drivers like the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety that's upping their speeds too. They're, they're looking at upwards of 70 kph now, which is about 43 miles an hour. So we need to make that better. We need to make crash avoidance better. No <laughs> doubt about it. So, so Jennifer, why is it limited to 70 kph right now? Why, why couldn't it be 70 mph? Right. Now, the, now the, there are limitations to physics, right? Time and distance. Um, the, the bigger your vehicle is, the, uh, the faster it's going to need to be able to put on those brakes and slow down the momentum of that vehicle. There are also limitations to cameras and sensor technology. If you go too far into looking around and wanting to brake for everything, you're going to get false alerts. And nobody wants that. So you have to carefully balance um, the crash avoidance, even at the lower, kind of walking into it lower speeds, increasing as the sensors get better, as the logic, the software in these systems gets better, to really balance whether you can do the automatic emergency brake application or not. You know, you have to know what's out there in front of you and make that split decision, split second decision, um, without overly burdening and causing some other issues, unintended consequences, essentially. Is of the technology. Is generative AI going to play a role in this? I mean, could artificial intelligence help determine, hey, th th this is going to be a false positive, we can ignore, ignore it, or, or here's a real emergency? Yeah, I mean, the term AI, I love it. I mean, we've had, we've had elements of AI in vehicles ever since like the advent of analog braking systems, right? There, anything that's automated, that the system, the technology is thinking for us and doing ourselves, so even if it's pulsing uh, a brake, there's elements of automation in vehicles. So yes, the, the new term is AI. It's really just another way of saying that we're having software learn 
what we're doing and able to take some steps and step in and help us out because the human mind is still the most critical thing to drive. We still think the most important system in a vehicle is a driver, but we can have these other systems like automatic emergency braking there to augment uh, the, uh, the human driver and learn from us. And really in that way, like use AI essentially to, to help us be better drivers and to pre prevent those crashes. So we've got automated emergency braking. How about emergency steering? I, I, I've seen at least one example from a steering company that uh, looked awfully promising to me. It is promising. It is absolutely promising. When you have an open lane to one side or another, that's what the human would do, right? We would not only brake, but we could steer to avoid. And that's absolutely on the forefront. Um, lots of conversation around that possibly coming out in new models. Um, in fact, that element of automatic emergency steering is now built into the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety's new, what they call front crash prevention 2.0 that they're running. You can both brake and steer to avoid. Uh, I think that one is a box trailer in front of you which is quite terrifying, but that is one of the elements that they are looking into as well. A any idea when we'll see emergency steering coming to uh, into production? I I've seen it on prototype vehicles um, from a variety of manufacturers now. So yeah, I, I think it'll it'll be on the forefront. We're going to see that probably pretty soon. Um, it is those the cameras and lane markings. So we have to also think about uh, vehicle safety as a safe systems approach. It's not just safe vehicles. We need safe roadways, safe drivers, safe people. Um, but for the roadway side of that, we need really good lane markings, right? So it's not for, especially for steering, the vehicle needs to know where it is in time and space and where it can go. And for that, we really need to work with our highway safety engineering partners to make sure that the, the roads are designed in a way that our vehicles can see those escape paths properly. Yeah, uh, distraction, you, you brought that up. Huge right. issue, right? I, I mean, I notice it even in myself. <laughs> I hate right. to admit, and it, it's not like I'm, I'm looking on my phone or, or other things like that. But, you know, in today's cars with these, these screens where you have to reach over, you know, to touch something and you have to look to see where your finger is going as opposed to knobs and buttons, which you can almost do tactily without looking at them. Um, and sometimes you have to go down a screen or two, you know, into a different menu. Um, is that part of what Mazda is addressing in terms of driver distraction? It really is that whole interior, whole vehicle approach, like that user interface. We call it the, the human machine interface. Our approach at this time has really been to steer people away from touching the screen. Now, our more recent models, you can enable that when you're in CarPlay, Apple CarPlay or Android Auto modes only, because people are just natively used to touching the Apple CarPlay or Android Auto uh, interfaces. But in the Mazda, we, we actually use a, a dial, a handheld a, a dial right at the palm of your hand. Um, and I find that is it, you have to get used to it because if you've never driven one like that before, you have to get used to it. But it does avoid you having to reach and touch the the, the console itself, or the, the screen itself, which I find to be much better and keeping your eyes heads up. Those heads up displays, no, those aren't standard equipment at this time, but they are very helpful in keeping you engaged. Really the most important thing in all of this is being getting accustomed to your vehicle and its setting. So you're not having to fuck with it too much while you're driving, that's a big part. But the phone is really the number one distractor. And what we recommend as a, as a mother, as a driver, as just somebody out on the road and we see it, stop at any stoplight, look left, look right, somebody's on their phone, right? Put it out of reach. We're all tempted. I mean, those phones, they, they draw us in. We are all tempted to touch them, even those of us that know better. So just put it in your bag, backseat, something like that out of reach, but you can still safely connect using those interfaces. Yeah. Uh Look, you know, the every modern car today, you can pair your phone to your right. car, drive with both hands on the wheel and still have a conversation on your phone. Uh, isn't there anything that the industry can do to uh, make phones? And I, I guess there's safety issues with that, too, in, in case of emergency. But boy, uh, you're, you're absolutely right. I live in the state of Michigan. Now it's been banned. You're not allowed to use your your phone in your hand it has right. to be paired with your car um and yet you know uh, either the word hasn't gotten out or or some people just ignore it but you still see people on their phone yeah and actually so it's april and april is uh 
Distracted Driver Awareness Month. Um, so it's a great time that we're talking about this. Enforcement's a critical part of it. Like I mentioned, the safe systems approach. We as part of that safer vehicles, safer roads, and safer people, right? So the people, uh, the our behaviors have to be part, be part of that and enforcement. So law enforcement can step in in the state of Michigan now and pull you over or give you a ticket if they see you uh, holding the phone. But still, it's it's tough. Like even though people know that. <laughs> they know it's illegal. They know it's wrong. They don't want to do it and they will speak to say it's bad. But yet we're still drawn to do it. Um, so we have to, like you said, linking through the booth to Bluetooth, you don't have to completely disconnect yourself. It's possible to stay engaged um, and plugged into your phone safely, but putting it in your hand and doing text messages and things like that, it's we, we got to stop it. Um, there is some methods uh, you mentioned, like technology. In your iPhone, you can you can en enable driving focus, which your phone will remind you. Like if you pick it up and you try to, you know, Apple's part of the the phone manufacturers are part of the solution too. Mm -hmm. I, my, my guess is uh, the people who are going to use their phone are not going to enable that, whether it's right. on their phone or not. And you can you can override it, of course, too. Yeah. Right. Um, whatever happened to V to V technology, vehicle to vehicle communication? I saw a demonstration of that twenty years ago. That blew me away. It can literally make cars, uh, make it impossible for cars to crash into each other. Fairly inexpensive technology that was, I'm not going to say production ready 20 years ago, but it was certainly production ready 10 years ago. And, and to me, this could even be more important than seatbelts or airbags. It is a fascinating discussion what happened to V2V. So, um, the FM, FMVSS 150, there was actually a federal motor vehicle safety standard that was put on the table by NHTSA called FMVSS 150 for V to X uh, communications, V to V, V to X communications. Um, it has since been rescinded, no activity, it's over, it's done. Um, it was going to be using DSRC uh, technology, dedicated short range communications. Um, now that technology had a, a part of the 5.9 gigahertz communication band dedicated to it. Towards right. it. Part and of the Wi-Fi band. Yes. Yeah. And it got cut by more than half. Um, so reallocated towards Wi-Fi and other forms of communications. That was part of the puzzle of why that kind of rose up, but then essentially is is really taking a back seat now to things like uh, cellular V to V communication using the cellular network instead of dedicated short range um, communications. Now the two things can work together. Essentially, all modern vehicles have chips, right? Just like your phone, you have a, a communications chip in your phone. We have those in the cars too. Uh, so they can communicate up to the cellular network and then back and really keep the, the vehicles know like time and space where they are. I kind of sometimes uh, when we're talking about crashes, I just define it as simply as possible. The definition of a crash is occupying the same space at the same time of another vehicle, right? So if we can prevent that, then we could avoid all crashes. Um, but there's still a lot of work that needs to be done in the government to set aside those communication spaces to make that really enabled. The technology itself, like you said, it's it's chips and they're, they've been around communication chips, but working cohesively together with all of the auto manufacturers and the Federal Communications Committee and the US Department of Transportation, there's been hurdles. There's been big hurdles in that. Um, so right now, the focus has been on doing that independently, like really working from the inside out, uh, the automotive industry working out rather than waiting for some kind of government mandate, um, because that's likely not going to happen at this point. Really looking at that from how can we do other things and rely more on cameras and other sensors that are vehicle based technologies, which we have more control over. Yeah. Well, I, I'll just tell you, I'm making it my personal mission to push for V to V coming back because... To me, it could be the most important safety technology in cars of all time. Right. It is really impactful. So what else are you guys working on then? Yeah, we haven't mentioned crash worthiness. We talked a lot about crash avoidance there. Um, so crash worthiness is a critical piece of the puzzle. Um, the One of the things we've been really proud of is achieving so many top safety pick and top safety pick plus awards from the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety. The majority of that uh, award winning criteria is still based in crash worthiness. So it has some components of crash avoidance. Pedestrian crash avoidance is a big part of that. But you also have to do exceptionally well 
in the front and side impact uh, cases where you have your dummy instrumented with all those sensors. It's got to, the dummy's got to do well, right? It can't, it can't have really high reads on any of uh, the data or high injury values. Um, so that's something that we've spent a lot of time, really our heritage is built in. Mazda for, for decades has really had a very strong foundation in the structural integrity and robust designs of our vehicles. So if we are involved in crashes, we're doing the best job we possibly can in protecting those occupants, just in the structural way, but then also in the advanced airbag systems. Of course, your seatbelt's part of that too. So let's not forget about that. The seatbelt's right. part of that front seat, rear seat, any seat. You got that's got to be fundamental. But then also having smart airbags, uh, frontal airbags. Now, modern vehicles don't have just two airbags anymore. It's not just those frontal airbags for the driver and the passenger. There's upwards of ten. Now in these vehicles, we've got knee bolster airbags um, to protect lower extremities. We've got the side curtain airbags, the side impact airbags that are mounted in your seats, front seat, rear seat. We've really made um, an intentional deployment of those standard across all of our models, regardless if it's the smallest Mazda 3 or our biggest CX-90. Uh, those have the full suite of the, these airbags that help protect the the drivers and their passengers in the event of a crash and that's what's earned us those those top safety pick awards we were the first small suv in their original series to get a good rating in the new side impact test and now they are running the new uh, moderate front overlap test and we've also achieved good ratings in that so i imagine that mazda has good headlamps too because to get that plus you've got to right. have good headlamps right right so the headlamps was a critical part of the top safety pick um, award. They introduced that, I think maybe three or four years ago, and now it's just ingrained into it. Um, we were a leader in that too. We have a great headlight engineering department. Um, we have the adaptive front headlights that turn with the vehicle. Those help redu reduce glare. And glare, um, you actually get demerits uh, if you add too much of that to the roadway surface in IHS's protocol. Um, so yeah, we're really proud of having all good and acceptable rated headlights from IHS. Real good. Well, Jennifer, uh, I, I really like hearing what you're saying. I think that's a noble goal to eliminate all fatalities by 2040. And of course, if you're eliminating fatalities, you're probably eliminating a lot of injuries as well. And right. that's part of the, the whole traffic fatality equation that gets ignored a lot. You know, in the United States alone, we send 2 million people to the hospital every single year from uh, injuries and in motor vehicle accidents. And uh, so imagine the impact on the American healthcare system if we could eliminate 2 million people going to the hospital every year. Right, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a big goal and it extends into all kinds of ranges of, of automotive. And it's not just Mazda that's working on this. We partner with a lot of the other um, OEMs, the Alliance for Automotive Innovation, our association group. And we work really closely with consumer groups like the Insurance Institute for Highway Safety and Consumer Reports and the government. This is, um, this is a whole team uh, that's gonna have to go after this. Excellent, kudos to you guys. And thanks for your time today. Awesome, thank you, John.